The Three Tools of Death by G. K. Chesterton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Tomlinson, London, March 2017 both by calling and conviction father brown knew better than most of us that every man is dignified when he is dead but even he felt a pang of incongruity when he was knocked up at daybreak and told that sir aaron armstrong had been murdered there was something absurd and unseemly about secret violence in connection with so entirely entertaining and popular a figure for sir aaron armstrong was entertaining to the point of being comic and popular in such a manner as to be almost legendary it was like hearing that sunny jim had hanged himself or that mr pickwick had died in hanwell for though sir aaron was a philanthropist and thus dealt with the darker side of our society he prided himself on dealing with it in the brightest possible style his political and social speeches were cataracts of anecdotes and loud laughter his bodily health was of a bursting sort his ethics were all optimism and he dealt with the drink problem his favourite topic with that immortal or even monotonous gaiety which is so often a mark of the prosperous total abstainer the established story of his conversation was familiar on the more puritanic platforms and pulpits how he had been when only a boy drawn away from scotch theology to scotch whisky and how he had risen out of both and become as he modestly put it what he was yet his wide and white beard cherubic face and sparkling spectacles at the numberless dinners and congresses where they appeared made it hard to believe somehow that it had ever been anything so morbid as either a dram drinker or a calvinist he was one felt the most seriously merry of all the sons of men he had lived in the rural skirt of hampstead in a handsome house high but not broad a modern and prosaic tower the narrowest of its narrow sides overhung the steep green bank of a railway and was shaken by passing trains sir aaron armstrong as he boisterously explained had no nerves but if the train had often given a shock to the house that morning the tables were turned and it was the house that gave a shock to the train the engine slowed down and stopped just beyond that point where an angle of the house impinged upon the sharp slope of turf the arrest of most mechanical things must be slow but the living cause of this had been very rapid a man clad completely in black even it was remembered to the dreadful detail of black gloves appeared on the ridge above the engine and waved his black hands like some sable windmill this in itself would hardly have stopped even a lingering train but there came out of him a cry which was talked of afterwards as something utterly unnatural and new it was one of those shouts that are horribly distinct even when we cannot hear what is shouted the word in this case was murder but the engine driver swears he would have pulled up just the same if he had heard only the dreadful and definite accent and not the word the train once arrested the most superficial stare could take in many features of the tragedy the man in black on the green bank was sir aaron armstrong's manservant magnus the baronet in his optimism had often laughed at the black gloves of this dismal attendant but no one was likely to laugh at him just now so soon as an inquirer or two had stepped off the line and across the smoky hedge they saw rolled down almost to the bottom of the bank the body of an old man in a yellow dressing-gown with a very vivid scarlet lining a scrap of rope seemed caught about his leg entangled presumably in a struggle there was a smear or so of blood though very little 
but the body was bent or broken into a posture impossible to any living thing. It was Sir Aaron Armstrong. A few more bewildered moments brought out a big, fair-bearded man, whom some travellers could salute as the dead man's secretary, Patrick Royce, once well known in Bohemian society, and even famous in the Bohemian arts. In a manner more vague, but even more convincing, he echoed the agony of the servant. By the time the third figure of that household, Alice Armstrong, daughter of the dead man, had come already tottering and waving into the garden, the engine driver had put a stop to his stoppage. The whistle had blown, and the train had panted on to get help from the next station. Father Brown had been thus rapidly summoned at the request of Patrick Royce, the big ex-Bohemian secretary. Royce was an Irishman by birth, and that casual kind of Catholic that never remembers his religion until he's really in a hole. But Royce's request might have been less promptly complied with if one of the official detectives had not been a friend and admirer of the unofficial Flambeau, and it was impossible to be a friend of Flambeau without hearing numberless stories about Father Brown. Hence, while the young detective, whose name was Merton, led the little priest across the field to the railway, their talk was more confidential than could be expected between two total strangers. As far as I can see, said Mr. Merton candidly, there is no sense to be made of it at all. There is nobody one can suspect. Magnus is a solemn old fool, far too much of a fool to be an assassin. Royce has been the baronet's best friend for years, and his daughter undoubtedly adored him. Besides, it's all too absurd. Who would kill such a cheery old chap as Armstrong? Who could dip his hands in the gore of an after-dinner speaker? It would be like killing Father Christmas. Yes, it was a cheery house, assented Father Brown. It was a cheery house while he was alive. Do you think it will be cheery now he is dead? Merton started a little and regarded his companion with an enlivened eye. Now he is dead, he repeated. Yes, continued the priest stolidly. He was cheerful, but did he communicate his cheerfulness? Frankly, was anyone else in the house cheerful but he? A window in Merton's mind let in that strange light of surprise in which we see for the first time things we have known all along. He had often been to the Armstrongs on little police jobs of the philanthropist, and now he came to think of it, it was in itself a depressing house. The rooms were very high and very cold, the decoration mean and provincial, the draughty corridors were lit by electricity that was bleaker than moonlight, and though the old man's scarlet face and silver beard had blazed like a bonfire in each room or passage in turn, it did not leave any warmth behind it. Doubtless this spectral discomfort in the place was partly due to the very vitality and exuberance of its owner. He needed no stoves or lamps, he would say, but carried his own warmth with him. But when Merton recalled the other inmates, he was compelled to confess that they also were as shadows of their lord. The moody manservant with his monstrous back gloves was almost a nightmare. Royce, the secretary, was solid enough, a big bull of a man in tweeds, with a short beard, but the straw-coloured beard was startlingly salted with grey like the tweed, and the broad forehead was barred with premature wrinkles. He was good-natured enough also, but it was a sad sort of good nature, almost a heartbroken sort. He had the general air of being some sort of failure in life. As for Armstrong's daughter, it was almost incredible that she was his daughter. She was so pallid in colour and sensitive in outline. She was graceful, but there was a quiver in the very shape of her that was like the lines of an aspen. Merton had sometimes wondered if she had learnt to quail at the crash of the passing trains. "'You see,' said Father Brown, blinking modestly, "'I am not sure that the Armstrong cheerfulness is so very cheerful for other people. "'You say that nobody could kill such a happy old man, 
but I'm not sure. Ne nos inducas in tentationem. If I ever murdered somebody, he added quite simply, I dare say it might be an optimist. Why, cried Merton, amused, do you think people dislike cheerfulness? People like frequent laughter, answered Father Brown, but I don't think they like a permanent smile. Cheerfulness without humour is a very trying thing. They walked some way in silence along the windy grassy bank by the rail, and just as they came under the far-flung shadow of the tall Armstrong house, Father Brown said suddenly, like a man throwing away a troublesome thought rather than offering it seriously, Of course, drink is neither good nor bad in itself, but I can't help sometimes feeling that men like Armstrong want an occasional glass of wine to sadden them. Merton's official superior, a grizzled and capable detective named Gilda, was standing on the green bank waiting for the coroner, talking to Patrick Royce, whose big shoulders and bristly beard and hair towered above him. This was the more noticeable because Royce walked always with a sort of powerful stoop and seemed to be going about his small clerical and domestic duties in a heavy and humbled style, like a buffalo drawing a go-cart. He raised his head with unusual pleasure at the sight of the priest and took him a few paces apart. Meanwhile, Merton was addressing the older detective respectfully indeed, but not without a certain boyish impatience. "'Well, Mr. Gilder, have you got much farther with the mystery?' "'There is no mystery,' replied Gilder, as he looked under dreamy eyelids at the rooks. "'Well, there is for me, at any rate,' said Merton, smiling. "'It is simple enough, my boy,' observed the senior investigator, stroking his grey, pointed beard. Three minutes after you had gone for Mr. Royce's parson, the whole thing came out. You know that pasty-faced servant in the black gloves who stopped the train? I should know him anywhere. Somehow he rather gives me the creeps. Well, drawled Gilder, when the train had gone on again, that man had gone too. Rather a cool criminal, don't you think, to escape by the very train that went off for the police. You're pretty sure, I suppose, remarked the young man, that he really did kill his master? Yes, my son, I'm pretty sure, replied Gilda dryly, for the trifling reason that he has gone off with twenty thousand pounds in papers that were in his master's desk. No, the only thing worth calling the difficulty is how he killed him. The skull seems broken as with some big weapon, but there's no weapon at all lying about, and the murderer would have found it awkward to carry it away unless the weapon was too small to be noticed. Perhaps the weapon was too big to be noticed, said the priest, with an odd little giggle. Gilda looked around at this wild remark, and rather sternly asked Brown what he meant. Silly way of putting it, I know, said Father Brown apologetically. Sounds like a fairy tale. But poor Armstrong was killed with a giant's club, a great green club, too big to be seen, and which we call the earth. He was broken against this green bank we are standing on. How do you mean? asked the detective quickly. Father Brown turned his moon face up to the narrow façade of the house and blinked hopelessly up. Following his eyes, they saw that right at the top of this otherwise blind back quarter of the building, an attic window stood open. Don't you see? he explained, pointing a little awkwardly like a child. He was thrown down from there. Gilda frowningly scrutinised the window and then said, Well, it is certainly possible, but I don't see why you are so sure about it. Brown opened his grey eyes wide. Why, he said, there's a bit of rope round the dead man's leg. Don't you see that other bit of rope up there caught at the corner of the window? At that height the thing looked like the faintest particle of dust or hair but the shrewd old investigator was satisfied. "'You're quite right, sir,' he said to Father Brown. "'That is certainly one to you.' Almost as he spoke, a special train with one carriage took the curve of the line on their left, and stopping disgorged another group of policemen, in whose midst was the hangdog visage of Magnus, the absconded servant. 
"'By Jove, they've got him!' cried Gilder, and stepped forward with quite a new alertness. "'Have you got the money?' he cried to the first policeman. The man looked him in the face with a rather curious expression and said, No. Then he added, At least not here. Which is the inspector, please? asked the man called Magnus. When he spoke, everyone instantly understood how this voice had stopped a train. He was a dull-looking man with flat black hair, a colourless face, and a faint suggestion of the east in the level slits in his eyes and mouth. His blood and name, indeed, had remained dubious ever since Sir Aaron had rescued him from a waitership in a London restaurant, and, as some said, from more infamous things. But his voice was as vivid as his face was dead. Whether through exactitude in a foreign language or in deference to his master, who had been somewhat deaf, Magnus's tones had a peculiarly ringing and piercing quality, and the whole group quite jumped when he spoke. "'I always knew this would happen,' he said aloud with brazen blandness. "'My poor old master made game of me for wearing black, "'but I always said I should be ready for his funeral.' "'And he made a momentary movement with his two dark-gloved hands. "'Sergeant,' said Inspector Gilder, eyeing the black hands with wrath, "'Aren't you putting the bracelets on this fellow? "'He looks pretty dangerous.' "'Well, sir,' said the sergeant, with the same odd look of wonder, "'I don't know that we can.' "'What do you mean?' asked the other sharply. "'Haven't you arrested him?' "'A faint scorn widened the slit-like mouth, "'and the whistle of an approaching train seemed oddly to echo the mockery. "'We arrested him,' replied the sergeant gravely, just as he was coming out of the police station at Highgate, where he had deposited all his master's money in the care of Inspector Robinson. Gilder looked at the manservant in utter amazement. "'Why on earth did you do that?' he asked of Magnus. "'To keep it safe from the criminal, of course,' replied that person placidly. "'Surely,' said Gilder, "'Sir Aaron's money might have been safely left with Sir Aaron's family.' The tale of his sentence was drowned in the roar of the train as it went rocking and clanking. But through all the hell of noises to which that unhappy house was periodically subject, they could hear the syllabuses of Magnus's answer in all their bell-like distinctness. I have no reason to feel confidence in Sir Aaron's family. All the motionless men had the ghostly sensation of the presence of some new person, and Merton was scarcely surprised when he looked up and saw the pale face of Armstrong's daughter over Father Brown's shoulder. She was still young and beautiful in a silvery style, but her hair was of so dusty and hueless a brown that in some shadows it seemed to have turned totally grey. "'Be careful what you say,' said Royce gruffly. You're frightened, Miss Armstrong. I hope so, said the man with the clear voice. As the woman winced and everyone else wondered, he went on, I am somewhat used to Miss Armstrong's tremors. I have seen her trembling off and on for years, and some said she was shaking with cold, and some she was shaking with fear, but I know she was shaking with hate and wicked anger. "'Fiends that have had their feast this morning. "'She would have been away by now with her lover and all the money but for me, "'ever since my poor old master prevented her from marrying that tipsy blackguard.' "'Stop,' said Gilder very sternly. "'We have nothing to do with your family fancies or suspicions. "'Unless you have some practical evidence, your mere opinions—' "'Oh, I'll give you practical evidence,' cut in Magnus, in his hacking accent. You have to subpoena me, Mr. Inspector, and I shall have to tell the truth. And the truth is this. An instant after the old man was pitched bleeding out of the window, I ran into the attic and found his daughter swooning on the floor with a red dagger still in her hand. Allow me to hand that also to the proper authorities. He took from his tail pocket a long horn-hilted knife with a red smear on it, and handed it politely to the sergeant. Then he stood back again, and his slits of eyes almost faded from his face in one fat Chinese sneer. 
Merton felt an almost bodily sickness at the sight of him, and he muttered to Gilda, "'Surely you would take Miss Armstrong's word against his?' Father Brown suddenly lifted a face so absurdly fresh that it looked somehow as if he had just washed it. Yes, he said, radiating innocence, but is Miss Armstrong's word against his? The girl uttered a startled, singular little cry. Everyone looked at her. Her figure was rigid as if paralysed. Only her face within its frame of faint brown hair was alive with an appalling surprise. She stood like one of a sudden lassoed and throttled. This man, said Mr. Gilder gravely, actually says that you were found grasping a knife insensible after the murder. He says the truth, answered Alice. The next fact of which they were conscious was that Patrick Royce strode with his great stooping head into their ring and uttered the singular words. Well, if I've got to go, I'll have a bit of pleasure first. His huge shoulder heaved, and he sent an iron fist smash into Magnus's bland Mongolian visage, laying him on the lawn as flat as a starfish. Two or three of the police instantly put their hands on Royce, but to the rest it seemed as if all reason had broken up, and the universe were turning into a brainless harlequinade. "'None of that, Mr. Royce,' Gilder had called out authoritatively. "'I shall arrest you for assault.' "'No, you won't,' answered the secretary in a voice like an iron gong. "'You will arrest me for murder.' Gilda threw an alarmed glance at the man knocked down, but since that outraged person was already sitting up and wiping a little blood off a substantially uninjured face, he only said shortly, "'What do you mean?' "'It is quite true, as this fellow says,' explained Royce, "'that Miss Armstrong fainted with a knife in her hand.' but she had not snatched the knife to attack her father, but to defend him. To defend him, repeated Gilda gravely. Against whom? Against me, answered the secretary. Alice looked at him with a complex and baffling face. Then she said in a low voice, After it all, I am still glad you are brave. "'Come upstairs,' said Patrick Royce heavily, "'and I will show you the whole cursed thing.' The attic, which was the secretary's private place, and rather a small cell for so large a hermit, had indeed all the vestiges of a violent drama. Near the centre of the floor lay a large revolver, as if flung away. Nearer to the left was rolled a whisky bottle, open but not quite empty. The cloth of the little table lay dragged and trampled, and the length of cord, like that found on the corpse, was cast wildly across the window sill. Two vases were smashed on the mantelpiece, and one on the carpet. "'I was drunk,' said Royce, and this simplicity in the prematurely battered man somehow had the pathos of the first sin of a baby. "'You all know about me,' he continued huskily, Everybody knows how my story began, and it may as well end like that too. I was called a clever man once, and might have been a happy one. Armstrong saved the remains of a brain and a body from the taverns, and was always kind to me in his own way, poor fellow. Only he wouldn't let me marry Alice here, and it will always be said that he was right enough. "'Well, you can form your own conclusions, "'and you won't want me to go into details. "'That is my whisky bottle half emptied in the corner. "'That is my revolver quite emptied on the carpet. "'It was the rope from my box that was found on the corpse, "'and it was from my window the corpse was thrown. "'You need not set detectives to grub up my tragedy. "'It is a common enough weed in this world. "'I give myself to the gallows, "'and, by God, that is enough.' At a sufficiently delicate sign, the police gathered round the large man to lead him away. But their unobtrusiveness was somewhat staggered by the remarkable appearance of Father Brown, who was on his hands and knees on the carpet in the doorway, as if engaged in some kind of undignified prayers. Being a person utterly insensible to the social figure he cut, he remained in this posture, but turned a bright round face up at the company, presenting the appearance of a quadruped with a very comic human head. "'I say,' he said good-naturedly, 
This really won't do at all, you know. At the beginning you said we'd found no weapon, but now we're finding too many. There's a knife to stab, and the rope to strangle, and the pistol to shoot, and after all he broke his neck by falling out of a window. It won't do. It's not economical. And he shook his head at the ground as a horse does grazing. Inspector Gilder had opened his mouth with serious intentions, but before he could speak the grotesque figure on the floor had gone on quite volubly. And now three quite impossible things. First these holes in the carpet, where the six bullets have gone in. Why on earth should anybody fire at the carpet? A drunken man lets fly at his enemy's head, the thing that's grinning at him. He doesn't pick a quarrel with his feet, or lay siege to his slippers. And then there's the rope, and having done with the carpet, the speaker lifted his hands and put them in his pocket, but continued unaffectedly on his knees. In what conceivable intoxication would anybody try to put a rope round a man's neck and finally put it round his leg? Royce, anyhow, was not so drunk as that, or he would be sleeping like a log by now. And plainest of all, the whisky bottle. You suggest a dipsomaniac fought for the whisky bottle, and then having one, rolled it away in a corner, spilling one half and leaving the other. That is the very last thing a dipsomaniac would do. He scrambled awkwardly to his feet and said to the self-accused murderer in tones of limpid penitence, I'm awfully sorry, my dear sir, but your tale is really rubbish. Sir, said Alice Armstrong in a low tone to the priest, can I speak to you alone for a moment? This request forced the communicative cleric out of the gangway, and before he could speak in the next room, the girl was talking with strange incisiveness. You are a clever man, she said, and you are trying to save Patrick, I know, but it's no use. The core of all this is black, and the more things you find out, the more there will be against the miserable man I love. Why? asked Brown, looking at her steadily. Because, she answered equally steadily, I saw him commit the crime myself. Ah, said the unmoved Brown. And what did he do? I was in the room next to them, she explained. Both doors were closed, but I suddenly heard a voice, such as I had never heard on earth, roaring, Hell, 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 again and again. And then the two doors shook with the first explosions of the revolver. Thrice again the thing banged before I got the two doors open and found the room full of smoke. But the pistol was smoking in my poor, mad Patrick's hand, and I saw him fire the last murderous volley with my own eyes. Then he leapt on my father, who was clinging in terror to the window sill, and grappling, tried to strangle him with the rope, which he threw over his head, but which slipped over his struggling shoulders to his feet. Then it tightened round one leg, and Patrick dragged him along like a maniac. I snatched a knife from the mat, and, rushing between them, managed to cut the rope before I fainted. I see, said Father Brown, with the same wooden civility. Thank you. As the girl collapsed under her memories, the priest passed stiffly into the next room, where he found Gilda and Merton alone with Patrick Royce, who sat in a chair handcuffed. There, he said to the inspector submissively, Might I say a word to the prisoner in your presence, and might he take off those funny cuffs for a minute? He is a very powerful man, said Merton in an undertone. Why do you want them taken off? Why, I thought, replied the priest humbly, that perhaps I might have the very great honour of shaking hands with him. Both detectives stared, and Father Brown added, Won't you tell them about it, sir? The man in the chair shook his tussled head, and the priest turned impatiently. Then I will, he said. Private lives are more important than public reputations. I am going to save the living, and let the dead bury their dead. He went to the fatal window, and blinked out of it as he went on talking. I told you that in this case there were too many weapons and only one death. I tell you now that they were not weapons, and were not used to cause death. All those grisly tools, the noose, the bloody knife, the exploding pistol, were instruments of a curious mercy. 
They were not used to kill Sir Aaron, but to save him. To save him, repeated Gilda. And from what? From himself, said Father Brown. He was a suicidal maniac. What? cried Merton in an incredulous tone. And the religion of cheerfulness? It is a cruel religion, said the priest, looking out of the window. Why couldn't they let him weep a little, like his father's before him? His plans stiffened, his views grew cold. Behind that merry mask was the empty mind of the atheist. At last, to keep up his hilarious public level, he fell back on that dram-drinking he had abandoned long ago. But there is this horror about alcoholism in a sincere teetotaler that he pictures and expects the psychological inferno from which he has warned others. It leapt upon poor Armstrong prematurely, and by this morning he was in such a case that he sat here and cried he was in hell, in so crazy a voice that his daughter did not know it. He was mad for death, and with the monkey tricks of the mad he had scattered round him death in many shapes, a running noose and his friend's revolver and a knife. Royce entered accidentally and acted in a flash. He flung the knife on the mat behind him, snatched up the revolver, and having no time to unload it, emptied it shot after shot all over the floor. The suicide saw a fourth shape of death and made a dash for the window. The rescuer did the only thing he could, ran after him with the rope and tried to tie him hand and foot. Then it was that the unlucky girl ran in and, misunderstanding the struggle, strove to slash her father free. At first she only slashed poor Royce's knuckles, from which has come all the little blood in this affair. But of course you noticed that he left blood, but no wound, on that servant's face. Only before the poor woman swooned, she did hack her father loose, so that he went crashing through that window into eternity. There was a long stillness slowly broken by the metallic noises of Gilda unlocking the handcuffs of Patrick Royce, to whom he said, I think I should have told the truth, sir. You and the young lady are worth more than Armstrong's obituary notices. Confound Armstrong's notices, cried Royce roughly. Don't you see it was because she mustn't know? Mustn't know what? asked Merton. Why, that she killed her father, you fool, roared the other. He'd have been alive now but for her. It might craze her to know that. No, I don't think it would, remarked Father Brown as he picked up his hat. I rather think I should tell her. Even the most murderous blunders don't poison life like sins. Anyhow, I think you may both be the happier now. I got to go back to the deaf school. As he went out on to the gusty grass, an acquaintance from Highgate stopped him and said, The coroner has arrived. The inquiry is just going to begin. I've got to get back to the deaf school, said Father Brown. I'm sorry I can't stop for the inquiry. End of The Three Tools of Death by G. K. Chesterton The Trailer Murder Mystery by Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. In the year 1841, there resided, at different points in the state of Illinois, three brothers by the name of Trailer. Their Christian names were William, Henry, and Archibald. Archibald resided at Springfield, then as now the seat of government of the state. He was a sober, retiring, and industrious man of about thirty years of age, a carpenter by trade and a bachelor, boarding with his partner in business, a Mr. Myers. Henry, a year or two older, was a man of like retiring and industrious habits, had a family, and resided with it on a farm at Clary's Grove, about twenty miles distant from Springfield in a northwesterly direction. William, still older, and with similar habits, resided on a farm in Warren County, distant from Springfield something more than a hundred miles in the same northwesterly direction. He was a widower with several children. 
In the neighborhood of William's residence there was, and had been for several years, a man by the name of Fisher, who was somewhat above the age of fifty, had no family and no settled home, but who boarded and lodged a while here and a while there, with persons for whom he did little jobs of work. His habits were remarkably economical, so that an impression got about that he had accumulated a considerable amount of money. In the latter part of May, in the year mentioned, William formed the purpose of visiting his brothers at Clary's Grove in Springfield, and Fisher, at the time having his temporary residence at his house, resolved to accompany him. They set out together in a buggy with a single horse. On Sunday evening they reached Henry's residence and stayed overnight. On Monday morning, being the first Monday of June, they started on to Springfield, Henry accompanying them on horseback. They reached town about noon, met Archibald, went with him to his boarding-house, and there took up their lodgings for the time they should remain. After dinner, the three trailers and Fisher left the boarding-house in company, for the avowed purpose of spending the evening together and looking about the town. At supper, the trailers had all returned, but Fisher was missing, and some inquiry was made about him. After supper, the trailers went out professedly in search of him. One by one they returned, the last coming in after late tea-time, and each stating that he had been unable to discover anything of Fisher. The next day, both before and after breakfast, they went professedly in search again, and returned at noon, still unsuccessful. Dinner again being had, William and Henry expressed a determination to give up the search and start for their homes. This was remonstrated against by some of the boarders about the house, on the ground that Fisher was somewhere in the vicinity, and would be left without any conveyance as he and William had come in the same buggy. The remonstrance was disregarded, and they departed for their homes, respectively. Up to this time, the knowledge of Fisher's mysterious disappearance had spread very little beyond the few boarders at Myers, and excited no considerable interest. After the lapse of three or four days, Henry returned to Springfield for the ostensible purpose of making further search for Fisher. Procuring some of the boarders, he, together with them and Archibald, spent another day in ineffectual search when it was again abandoned, and he returned home. No general interest was yet excited. On the Friday, week after Fisher's disappearance, the postmaster at Springfield received a letter from the postmaster nearest William's residence in Warren County, stating that William had returned home without Fisher and was saying rather boastfully that Fisher was dead and had willed him his money and that he had got about $1,500 by it. The letter further stated that William's story and conduct seemed strange and desired the postmaster at Springfield to ascertain and write what was the truth in the matter. The postmaster at Springfield made the letter public, and at once excitement became universal and intense. Springfield at that time had a population of about 3,500 with a city organization. The Attorney General of the State resided there. A purpose was forthwith formed to ferret out the mystery, in putting which into execution the mayor of the city and the Attorney General took the lead to make search for and if possible find the body of the man supposed to be murdered was resolved on as the first step in pursuance of this men were formed into large parties and marched abreast in all directions so as to let no inch of ground in the vicinity remain unsearched examinations were made of cellars wells and pits of all descriptions where it was thought possible the body might be concealed all the fresh or tolerably fresh graves in the graveyard were pried into and dead horses and dead dogs were disinterred where in some instances they had been buried by their partial masters. This search, as has appeared, commenced on Friday. It continued until Saturday afternoon without success, when it was determined to dispatch officers to arrest William and Henry at their residences, respectively. The officers started on Sunday morning. Meanwhile, the search for the body was continued, and rumors got afloat of the trailers having passed at different times and places several gold pieces, which were readily supposed to have belonged to Fisher. On Monday, the officers sent for Henry, having arrested him, arrived with him. The mayor and attorney general took charge of him, and set their wits to work to elicit a discovery from him. He denied, and denied, and persisted in denying. They still plied him in every conceivable way, till Wednesday, when protesting his own innocence, he stated that his brothers, William and Archibald, had murdered Fisher, that they had killed him, without his, Henry's, knowledge at the time, and made a temporary concealment of his body that immediately preceding his and William's departure from Springfield for home, on Tuesday, the day after Fisher's disappearance, William and Archibald communicated the fact to him and engaged his assistance in making a permanent concealment of the body. 
that at the time he and William left professedly for home, they did not take the road directly, but meandering their way through the streets, entered the woods at the northwest of the city, two or three hundred yards to the right of where the road they should have traveled entered them. That penetrating the woods some few hundred yards they halted, and Archibald came a somewhat different route on foot and joined them. That William and Archibald then stationed him, Henry, on an old and disused road that ran nearby as a sentinel, to give warning of the approach of any intruder. That William and Archibald then removed the buggy to the edge of a dense brush thicket about forty yards distant from his, Henry's, position, where leaving the buggy they entered the thicket, and in a few minutes returned with the body and placed it in the buggy. That from his station he could, and did, distinctly see that the object placed in the buggy was a dead man, of the general appearance and size of Fisher. That William and Archibald then moved off with the buggy in the direction of Hickox's mill pond, and after an absence of half an hour returned, saying they had put him in a safe place. That Archibald then left for town, and he and William found their way to the road, and made for their homes. At this disclosure all lingering credulity was broken down, and excitement rose to an almost inconceivable height. Up to this time the well-known character of Archibald had repelled and put down all suspicions as to him. Till then, those who were ready to swear that a murder had been committed were almost as confident that Archibald had had no part in it. But now he was seized and thrown into jail, and indeed his personal security rendered it by no means objectionable to him. And now came the search for the brush thicket, and the search of the mill pond. The thicket was found, and the buggy tracks at the point indicated. At a point within the thicket, the signs of a struggle were discovered, and a trail from thence to the buggy track was traced. In attempting to follow the track of the buggy from the thicket, it was found to proceed in the direction of the mill pond, but could not be traced all the way. At the pond, however, it was found that a buggy had been backed down to and partially into the water's edge. Search was now to be made in the pond, and it was made in every imaginable way. Hundreds and hundreds were engaged in raking, fishing, and draining. After much fruitless effort in this way, on Thursday morning the mill dam was cut down, and the water of the pond partially drawn off, and the same processes of search again gone through with. About noon of this day, the officer sent for William returned having him in custody, and a man calling himself Dr. Gilmore came in company with him. It seems that the officer arrested William at his own house, early in the day on Tuesday, and started to Springfield with him, that after dark a while they reached Lewiston, in Fulton County, where they stopped for the night, that late in the night this Dr. Gilmore arrived, stating that Fisher was alive at his house, and that he had followed on to give the information so that William might be released without further trouble, that the officer, distrusting Dr. Gilmore, refused to release William, but brought him on to Springfield, and the doctor accompanied them. On reaching Springfield, the doctor reasserted that Fisher was alive and at his house. At this, the multitude for a time were utterly confounded. Gilmore's story was communicated to Henry Trailer, who, without faltering, reaffirmed his own story about Fisher's murder. Henry's adherence to his own story was communicated to the crowd, and at once the idea started, and became nearly, if not quite universal, that Gilmore was a confederate of the trailers, and had invented the tale he was telling to secure their release and escape. Excitement was again at its zenith. About three o'clock the same evening, Myers, Archibald's partner, started with a two-horse carriage for the purpose of ascertaining whether Fisher was alive, as stated by Gilmore, and if so, of bringing him back to Springfield with him. On Friday, a legal examination was gone into before two justices, on the charge of murder against William and Archibald. Henry was introduced as a witness by the prosecution, and on oath reaffirmed his statements, as heretofore detailed, and at the end of which he bore a thorough and rigid cross-examination without faltering or exposure. The prosecution also proved, by a respectable lady, that on the Monday evening of Fisher's disappearance, she saw Archibald, whom she well knew, and another man whom she did not then know, but whom she believed at the time of testifying to be William, then present, and still another, answering the description of Fisher, all enter the timber at the northwest of town, the point indicated by Henry, and after one or two hours, saw William and Archibald return without Fisher. Several other witnesses testified that on Tuesday, at the time William and Henry professedly gave up the search for Fisher's body and started for home, they did not take the road directly, but did go into the woods, as stated by Henry. By others also it was proved that since Fisher's disappearance, William and Archibald had passed rather an unusual number of gold pieces. 
The statements heretofore made about the thicket, the signs of a struggle, the buggy tracks, etc., were fully proven by numerous witnesses. At this the prosecution rested. Dr. Gilmore was then introduced by the defendants. He stated that he resided in Warren County, about seven miles distant from William's residence, that on the morning of William's arrest he was out from home and heard of the arrest and of its being on a charge of the murder of Fisher, that on returning to his own house he found Fisher there, that Fisher was in very feeble health and could give no rational account as to where he had been during his absence, that he, Gilmore, then started in pursuit of the officer, as before stated, and that he should have taken Fisher with him, only that the state of his health did not permit. Gilmore also stated that he had known Fisher for several years, and that he had understood he was subject to temporary derangement of mind, owing to an injury about his head received in early life. There was about Dr. Gilmore so much of the air and manner of truth that his statement prevailed in the minds of the audience and of the court, and the trailers were discharged, although they attempted no explanation of the circumstances proven by the other witnesses. On the next Monday, Myers arrived in Springfield, bringing with him the now famed Fisher in full life and proper person. Thus ended this strange affair, and while it is readily conceived that a writer of novels could bring a story to a more perfect climax, it may well be doubted whether a stranger affair ever really occurred. Much of the matter remains in mystery to this day. The going into the woods with Fisher, and returning without him by the trailers, their going into the woods at the same place the next day after they professed to have given up the search, the signs of a struggle in the thicket, the buggy tracks at the edge of it and the location of the thicket and the signs about it, corresponding precisely with Henry's story, are circumstances that have never been explained. William and Archibald have both died since, William in less than a year, and Archibald in about two years after the supposed murder. Henry is still living, but never speaks of the subject. It is not the object of the writer of this to enter into the many curious speculations that might be indulged upon the facts of this narrative, yet he can scarcely forbear a remark upon what would almost certainly have been the fate of William and Archibald had Fisher not been found alive. It seems he had wandered away in mental derangement, and had he died in this condition and his body been found in the vicinity, it is difficult to conceive what could have saved the trailers from the consequence of having murdered him. Or, if he had died and his body never found, the case against them would have been quite as bad. For although it is a principle of law that a conviction for murder shall not be had unless the body of the deceased be discovered, it is to be remembered that Henry testified that he saw Fisher's dead body. End of the Trailer Murder Mystery by Abraham Lincoln Walking the Rainbow by Grace King this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Walking the Rainbow by Grace King In spite of the careful attention of friends and the assiduities of tale-bearers, we live in a woeful state of ignorance as to the true condition of the sentiments of any one about us and when we interrogate our own judgment we get no better enlightenment for unfortunately we are all addicted to the pleasant habit of counting as friends those whom we like as enemies those whom we dislike for that reason alone and only that reason mr talbot's memory did not carry monsieur pinceau as a friend the ridiculous attempts at speech-making and the undignified campaign activities in favor of a political trickster that rankled so painfully in the creole gentleman's remembrances of the past did not trouble the american at all but the things that m pinceau passed over with indulgence those were the ones that mr talbot's memory recorded with unalterable condemnation in his own defeat in the triumph of the rival candidate he attributed nothing whatever to m pinceau whom he frankly did not credit with an idea in his head above fast living and extravagant spending of his wife's money of in short playing the fool as he called it and of making associates of men who were also given to that pastime 
which shows among other verities how much more importance than they deserve we attach to our pitiful efforts to overthrow a good character and reputation when mr talbot heard his wife's report about mademoiselle mimi he was vastly pleased all the money in the world he said enthusiastically could not procure better instruction or instruction that agreed better with his ideas it was what he had hoped when he had money with which to realize his hopes a lady he explained must furnish example as well as precept to her pupils his objection to most governesses and teachers was that they were such a warning against themselves generally an ugly forlorn disappointed and soured set of women with far more of the furies than the graces about them a teacher should represent to a little girl what she would like to be for little girls learn by imitation mostly mrs talbot never contested the opinions of her husband her way of entertaining him was to let him talk to her and to agree with him as for the reasons of things she seldom thought of them the things themselves she was wont to say were as much as she could tackle give the little girls a good model he continued and the battle is half won he would never allow a daughter of his to emphasizing his meaning be taught by a man for she would end by trying to imitate him and the result would be a hobbledehoy mademoiselle could teach all that it was essential for a lady to know that is how to take her place in society and maintain it he smoked his pipe for a few minutes in silence and his wife knew as well as if he had told her that he was thinking of those old salons on royal st louis and sharp streets where as a young man fresh from the university of virginia he had met the charming society of the ladies whom he had never ceased to admire and whom he had chosen as the models for his daughters the only drawback he could see in mademoiselle mimi's school was monsieur pinceau and he charged his wife not to encourage any intimacy between the two families he himself had never wished to know the man had always avoided him and he would not suffer his children to be thrown familiarly into company that he disapproved of if the world were to be made of such as m pinceau was reputed to be there would be no morality and no law in it he knew personally nothing against him except that he went with a set of men that flaunted their follies and so demoralized society it was always easier to prevent than to break off he thought that mademoiselle mimi had better be told this at the outset firmly and frankly then there could be no misunderstanding in the future he confided to his wife this flaming sword and even instructed her as to how her delicate hands were to wield it do not let your politeness get the better of you be firm and decided there is nothing that a mother should be so decided about as the surroundings of her daughters mademoiselle mimi is a sensible woman and she will understand the importance of maintaining the standards of good society a man cannot make his assertions in such matters as a woman can a man represents at best only intellectual force women spiritual after a pause he continued if women chose they could rule the world through society we can better get along with a corrupt judiciary than a corrupt society do not hurt her feelings but make your point clear you can be clear enough when you want and you had better warn the children a little let them understand yes i will depend upon you to manage it yes do it in your own time and your own way ladies have a gift for such things a smile a word no more but what a rebuke a volume couldn't tell more a pistol shot be more killing he sank deep in his reflections perhaps over some such pistol shot in his own memory 
when there was no alternative between doing his will and being disagreeable his wife was forced to exercise some of the gifts which she also possessed in common with the charming ladies of his memory for as much as he knew about them she knew more he saw the outside of their gifts she the inside machinery tell a daughter she said to herself that her father is an improper acquaintance for little girls who know nothing against him and never will know anything against him make mademoiselle mimi understand that there must be no intercourse between the two families because in short my husband is better than her father where great heavens where in what salons ancient or modern did ladies say such things one to another perhaps in the wilds of virginia where my husband was born but not here in louisiana where thank heaven i was born if it were the truth which it is mademoiselle mimi would surely know it better than any one else how could she help knowing it what did her whole life mean otherwise her misfortunes her labor her unselfish devotion what did it all mean to her if not just that but tell her so make her understand it which means to make her acknowledge and confess it mademoiselle mimi would very soon put an end to any such conversation as that and to save society heavens above go around denouncing one another's fathers brothers husbands that would be a feasible way of saving it eh what society would be left and what woman would be sure enough of her own father husband brother ay sister and even mother there had been this consideration in some families that she knew of go around denouncing this one and that no no women maintain society by just the opposite plan men denounce the criminal but hold on to the crime women denounce the crime but hold on to the criminal that is the difference between them and mademoiselle mimi was right a thousand times right as a woman husbands despite their convictions and their superior assumptions to the contrary have really no advantage over other men in knowledge of a woman's mind or in short of the inner determinations of a wife's mind they can only know in truth what the wife chooses to tell them and a discreet wife often chooses to limit her communications of this kind wives for example such as mr talbot admired in the old salons who were as unlike missionaries as one can possibly conceive they were not women to brandish moral swords they were women on the contrary like mademoiselle mimi so mrs talbot was quite clear in this at least that mademoiselle would be talked to as her husband directed at the greek calends and not before the bright glow of sunset shone in the sky it brightened the spire of the little church and seemed almost to give a golden tone to the thin weak voice of the angelus bell a few oranges still glittered amid the dark foliage of the hedge the sour bitter kind not the sweet ones whose flowers so poetically used to symbolize the hopes of brides and the old garden as an old face does sometimes from inward illumination flushed under the golden and rose light of the sky into a flicker of its pristine witchery and beauty the children were scattered through it fondling and caressing it as if indeed it were an old face i have never worked for anything in my life that i did not get it in the end the husband spoke meditatively from another milestone in his thoughts this was true but his wife had never heard him say so before there never had been any need to say it before it was taken for granted now but you worked hard for what you wanted she responded quickly with her sure instinct of affection it was always said about you that you were the hardest working young lawyer at the bar i always remember a story papa told about you he was passing your office once in the middle of winter long past midnight and seeing a light in your office all the other windows were black 
he went upstairs to see if anything were the matter opened the door and there you were over your books dressed just as you had come from some dinner-party or ball well talbot he said disgustedly her husband took up the story with a laugh you must love work love i answered i love it better than meat and bread his face showed his satisfaction at the memory of it she possessed the art of recalling such things and repeating them appropriately her memory was a treasury to her she never forgot a face a name a good deed a pleasant speech or a humorous incident yes her husband repeated with gusto i always loved to work i cared in fact for nothing in life that i did not work for what a man makes up his mind to work for he can obtain he added confidently and then he began to explain his plans again to her any one could understand them they were so simple and natural it was true he had lost a fortune everything he had worked for and gained since he had been a lawyer and he did not count in this what he should have inherited from his father who had died during the war and whose estate had been settled in confederate money he counted as his own only what he had made and no man had made more or larger fees than his he called over as lawyers never tire of doing his cases in the past and the briefs the historic briefs he called them that he had written having saved his library he said was the greatest piece of good fortune that could happen to him or any lawyer if that had been lost he would have considered himself unfortunate the loss of his plantation would have been nothing in comparison to it with its accumulation of private notes and records it was perhaps the most complete in the city he knew he would not have exchanged it for any he had ever seen and he was lucky too in having his same old office he could take up just where he had left off four years ago and as far as he could see it was only a question of work with him to catch up on the losses of the war fortunately litigation could not be captured confiscated or burned the fact is he concluded with a frank laugh if there is any important lawsuit there are four or five of us who are bound to be retained on one side or the other the only change he would make from former plans was that instead of sending his sons to the university of virginia as he had intended he would put them to work just as soon as they knew enough of the requisites that is latin greek and mathematics with sufficient science for respectability which was far more than the greatest americans had started with fifty years ago if there was anything in the boys they could get along on the education he was able to give them if they could not get along on that it was a pretty good sign they would not get along on a better the daughters would suffer less in education for they could learn easier all that ladies needed to know and take more time over it he had always counted on giving each one of her dower when she became of age so that she could marry or not just as she chose he had seen some unfortunate young girls marry for money some literally for the means of living a dower he feared would be beyond his reach now the consequences of the war would fall heavier on the women than on the men the lives of the men would be changed comparatively little but the women it was slavery alone that had kept them from domestic drudgery he shook his head and repeated domestic drudgery added to family duties he smoked his pipe a moment and continued with a new variation of his subject his wife listening without assent or dissent looking through his telescope whichever way he wanted either end the right one for her he ran over the list of his friends who like him had broken away from all that had constituted life to them to go into the war as he gave the name his wife's ready memory supplied her usual pleasant addenda of reminiscences how they used to like this one 
and that one and how this one and that one used to like him and praise him to her and all sorts of other items in connection with his friends that he had forgotten tossing over her little memories and rummaging in them as she once would have done in her great bureau drawer of scraps and like the lady's scraps of that time her bits from memory were all of beautiful quality silk velvet brocade real embroidery real lace buttons and buckles that looked like jewellery ribbons ostrich and marabou feathers all too pretty to throw away but so useless to keep except as souvenirs the duel that he had prevented the ugly family quarrel he had stopped a reconciliation between a husband and wife bent on divorce the last will and testament he had turned from resentment into forgiveness of injuries and how he had always stood by the unfortunate there was not a friend or client he could name that she could not connect with some personal obligation it was only the good lawyer's usual showing at that time and the wife's usual version of his services services that only lawyers and their wives enhance with any glamour of sentimental obligation for a lawyer's clients have no such glamour in their view of the transaction but it was a pleasant review and a drawer of scraps that any lawyer's wife would be glad to own even old benton millionaire and miser that he was had owned to her that the beginning of his great fortune was laid when talbot was a young law student and he benton a porter carrying bundles of goods on his back up and down four and five flights of stairs and there was tommy cook whom he had picked up out of the gutter for he could never see a bright boy run to waste without stretching out his hand to prevent it and and friends 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 wherever they looked in the past they saw friends and not an enemy for according to the pleasant weakness already mentioned they saw in the past none to whom they were not friendly forgetting of course contradictory experiences i shall let tommy cook keep his desk in the office what does he want with the desk there the wife asked innocently well not the black shoes on you may be sure tommy is a lawyer now how can he be a lawyer by study and work like other men but i always thought that lawyers had to be gentlemen i have never known a lawyer who is not a gentleman you have been very lucky then he answered dryly there was silence between them for a moment and then he took up the fallen thread of conversation again he has a pretty good practice already he gained a suit for benton the other day what did benton employ him he needed a lawyer and tommy is about as decent a one as he could find he has been associated at least with the bar yes as a bootblack some of the others wouldn't have made even decent bootblacks butlers and camp followers mostly she looked disgusted but said nothing what she asked brightening with a sudden inspiration what has become of the riparian case always before that is before the war that had separated them from their past in their talks about the future they would discuss this case she had completely forgotten it what a prominent object it had always been in her husband's horizon for years his ambition had rested on it it was to be in his eyes the masterpiece of his profession to give him fame throughout the legal world he used to say that if he never gained anything else but that one case he would have secured wealth for himself and his children so far-reaching would be the effects of a favourable decision the fee was contingent but he was as sure of getting it he used to say as he was sure the heavens would not fall from the time that he had been called to the bar he had aimed at that case he had studied and worked his way into it with such consummate patience and legal keenness that he was considered the only man in the city who had a perfect record of it in his mind it was as much his own as any piece of property he could have bought no matter when it was opened now or twenty years hence 
it could not be opened without his appearing in it as principal counsel how strange thought the wife that everything else should give way in the south government states rights social order and that a great war should be fought and thousands of lives lost and a mere question of the city's riparian rights should survive that like a lighthouse it should still be standing after the storm that has thrown the shore with wrecks this led her to ask about their friend dalton who having studied law in her husband's office had been employed in some minor capacity in this very riparian case dalton oh dalton went into the war a private and has come out a major well is he any more human any less like a fish cold and slippery as she had done about the riparian case her husband might well have wondered how such an idle and futile prejudice could survive the fierce tempest that had almost engulfed the national government and wrecked its apparently indestructible fortunes he answered quietly he is very much improved in appearance and seems full of energy he will stay in my office and use my library until he is able to set up an independent establishment a click of the gate's latchet caused them to raise their heads and look in that direction and as they saw who was coming down the walk toward them both exclaimed harry linton both stepped forward to meet him the aunt repeating with a glad smile harry harry i was thinking about him only to-day she had not seen him since he waved his cap in good-bye to her from the car window when his company left for virginia the gay young nephew who had lived with them while he studied law with his uncle whom he loved it may be said for his faults for he had made no display of the family virtues he was still boyish-looking and had still the same old irresistible expression of friendliness and good humour on his round freckled face and in his blue eyes and his light hair stood out as it used to in thick curls over his head the only change was a long ugly scar that extended over one side of his face from forehead to chin cutting across an eye he looked taller and showed the effect of drilling in his bearing but he was still shorter than his uncle by a full head they drew their chairs together the children clustering on the steps in good hearing well said his uncle what are you doing no no protested the aunt he must begin from the time he left us and tell us all his adventures i want to hear the whole story from beginning to end the young fellow laughed and told hurriedly how after he was wounded in virginia he had been sent back to louisiana to recuperate and then had been transferred to the louisiana command where in a desperate flight on red river a small company tried to delay the advance of the federal army which they succeeded in doing how he received his wound in the face and was insensible when he was taken prisoner and brought to new orleans after he was discharged from the hospital he was kept in prison until peace was declared the children crowded upon one another to get nearer to him while he talked along in his gay bright reckless way as soon as i could get out of the city he continued i started for home i hadn't heard a word from my people for a year and didn't know anything about them except that they had taken refuge in texas you know our place was just on the line of banks march his uncle nodded and then and then his aunt's voice quivered with impatience the chimneys are still standing and that is all that was left to show that there had been a human habitation there oh oh wailed the aunt that beautiful old house that fine plantation harry was too much amused at the story to come to waste time on the lament he threw his head back and laughed as at a joke <laughs> i wish you could have seen the family come back i was lucky enough to get there the day before i camped during the night in the shelter of my ancestral ruins that is in the furnace of the sugar house there were not enough ruins of anything else to shelter a cat laughing i knew they would come straight to the place as 
quick as they could travel and i had a presentiment that that would be about as quick as i could get there from the city while i was standing in front of my furnace looking about for something to look at when here they came just about dusk first a broken-down buggy tied with a rope drawn by a limping horse elizabeth was in it with heatherstone behind them came a little cart with a kind of cover over it drawn by an old gray mule mother drove that and it seemed filled with children their heads stuck out in all directions like chickens in a basket all laughed with him at this picture heatherstone was shot all to pieces at mansfield you know i had heard that he was wounded but i really did not know until i saw him that he had lost both an arm and a leg an arm and a leg oh harry cried his aunt in horror yes and on the hand he has left he has only three fingers the thumb and forefinger had to be amputated oh how does he stand it asked the uncle curtly interrupting the soft sympathetic voice he was the last man in the country to play the invalid with success invalid he an invalid Whew. harry threw back his head and whistled i was fool enough to think i might say something to him to show a little feeling to express some sort of sympathy and that sort of thing about his being a cripple by jove the young man jumped up to act the scene for them he turned upon me as if i were a yankee damn it sir do you dare sympathize with me sir damn your sympathy i don't want any man's damned sympathy take your damned sympathy where it is needed sir we don't need it here sir he was a capital mimic and did the scene so well that one saw the tall gaunt figure of his texan brother-in-law as well as heard him snarling out his short sentences i will let you know sir i am as good a man now sir as i ever was i can do without my legs sir and my arm sir the yankees are welcome to them sir damn them my wife sir doesn't need them either my wife sir at this moment is worth more than any hundred damn yankees i ever came across sir they didn't shoot off her leg sir or her arm and you needn't go offering her any of your damn sympathy either sir she doesn't need it and i took his advice i didn't sympathize any more with any of them you would never recognize elizabeth she goes stalking about in a pair of her husband's old cavalry boots and an old hat of his and she ties her skirts up to her knees like the negro women used to do in the fields and she wears a pistol stuck in her belt in fact she does everything she can to make a man out of herself except curse and smoke and the more of a man she is the better her husband likes it the two are always together mother takes care of the children how is your mother harry sat down and laughed at this memory also mother is not changed a particle not a shade she goes stepping around in her old faded calico dress and sunbonnet just exactly as she used to at princeton in that ugly old india shawl of hers and bird of paradise bonnet she is just as unbending just as firm just as sure of herself and she keeps heatherstone that's the eldest boy under her thumb just as she used to do me makes him study of nights and tells him what great things she expects of him exactly as she used to do with me not one of them will own to being hurt by the results of the war they poo poo their losses in fact they live as if the yankees were watching and listening to them all the time and they will die before they gratify them with a regret i found out seeing that his audience was waiting in silence for more on the subject that mother and sister had about fifty dollars in gold fifty dollars in gold his aunt exclaimed in amazement as if it were a fortune yes fifty dollars in gold how did they manage to save so much they didn't save it pausing to enhance his effect they made it made it ejaculated the aunt in still greater amazement how could they make money how could they make it for the first time 
his voice was grave why they were in some god-forsaken place in texas where the children were hungry for food and cold for clothes and they had to make money or beg but what could they do they knit they spun they cooked lowering his voice and speaking slower they took in washing and ironing and they planted a little cotton only a few rows for the knitting you know and at the end of the war they had a little pile of it stuffed into their mattresses of course it was good as gold and when heatherstone returned to them he came in a buggy with an old broken-down army horse that the commissary department allowed him as it was the only way he could travel the cart and the mule he managed to pick up somewhere i believe he gave one of his pistols for them how many children have they asked his aunt five they lost two heatherstone the eldest is a fine boy you did not make up your mind to stay with them asked his uncle the fact is uncle when i went there it was to stay with them and work on the old plantation and when i saw heatherstone i was determined to do so for i never felt so sorry for people in my life looking at his uncle and then at his aunt as when i saw them unloading themselves from their buggy and cart i could have stayed willingly with them and worked like a negro for them the rest of my days but they wouldn't hear of such a thing grew indignant at the very idea of it heatherstone seemed to take it as a reflection on himself and sister and mother waxed eloquent over my duty to become a great lawyer and chief justice of the state just as she used to do when we all had fortunes they camped out that night as they had done nearly every night of their journey from texas but by noon the next day they were having a shelter put up around one of the old chimneys heatherstone and elizabeth had gone out about daylight and rooted up some of the old negroes somewhere and found the lumber they said they could put up a very comfortable cabin for the fifty dollars and began at once to talk about a garden chickens and ten acres of cotton i suppose heatherstone the boy will do the ploughing when they get a plough and i have not the slightest doubt but that mother and elizabeth will help in the hoeing and of course all down to the youngest will take a hand in the picking in spite of his natural high spirits and his fondness for laughing at his people his voice grew sad as they didn't seem to have thought of me in any of their plans and in fact so far as i could see didn't need me or want me i concluded that the thing for me to do was to come back to the city and see if i could not make a little money here they will need ready money and that badly long before spring if i am not much mistaken well said his uncle reflectively i do not know but what you are right you selected the bar for your profession studied for it and were admitted i do not see any good reason why you should throw away all the time work and expense you gave to it your four years of soldiering ought not to make you a worse lawyer on the contrary it ought to make you a better one he smoked a few ships from his pipe and concluded with and i have always thought harry you ought to make a pretty good lawyer of yourself i believe myself said the young fellow rising that i could at least make a living for my mother and myself at it if i had a fair chance there is no telling however what the outcome of all this is going to be he added with rather a questioning look at his uncle oh was the answer i fancy the country will soon settle down and go to work to repair the losses that is what i'm going to do with a frank laugh i had thought the young fellow hesitated glancing furtively at his aunt as he used to do in critical ventures with his uncle i had thought of trying something else to make money a little quicker times are changed but we are not i don't know about that uncle but i do know i might get a clerkship somewhere a clerkship well it would give me some money at once the mother hastily gathered her children together it is their bedtime she explained with a cheerful voice but trying to make her nephew see her warning shake of the head 
he is no wiser about getting along with his uncle than he was before he went to the war she said to herself as she left the gallery but looking back from the room she saw the two men walking together down the path to the gate the elder one turning his head toward the younger one and she knew as well as if she heard the words that some of the funds brought by the herald of prosperity was to be dispatched at once to the cabin built around the chimney of the ruined plantation End of walking the rainbow by grace king from the pleasant ways of st medard white roses by l p jacks this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dan Gerzinski. White Roses by L. P. Jacks Of all the conversations of the learned, those in which history and philosophy maintain the dialogue are probably the most instructive. Such a conversation I was fortunate enough to hear not long ago at the dinner table of a friend and the occasion was more interesting inasmuch as the philosopher of the party was led by a turn of the argument to lay aside his mantle and assume the role of the storyteller thereby providing us with a valuable comment on the very philosophy with which his own illustrious name has been long associated we had been talking during dinner about a certain expedition to the south seas undertaken by the british government in the eighteenth century and the historian had just finished a most surprising narration of the facts, based on his recent investigation of unpublished documents, when our hostess glanced at the clock, and rising from her chair gave the signal to the ladies to depart. When we had resumed our places, the professor of philosophy said to the historian, I wish you would tell us what in your opinion it was that caused the expedition to turn out such an utter failure the expedition failed said the historian because the commander was not allowed to select his own crews the government of the day was corrupt and insisted on manning the ships with men of its own choosing some were diseased others were criminals many had never handled a rope in their lives before the fleet had doubled cape horn one-third of the crews had perished and the rest were mutinous the enterprise was doomed to failure from the start the whole planet is manned in the same manner said the pessimist as he helped himself to one of our host's superlative cigars i'm sorry for the commander whoever he is what precisely do you mean said the professor of philosophy holding a lighted match to the end of the pessimist's cigar i mean said the pessimist that the prospects of the human expedition can't be very bright so long as society has to put up with anybody and everybody who happens to be born. I suppose there is a human expedition, he went on. At least you have written as though there were. But who selects the crew? Nobody. They come aboard as they happen to be born, and the unfortunate commander has to put up with them as they come. Broken men, jail deliveries, invalids, seasick landlubbers, and heaven knows what— who in his senses would put to sea with such a crowd humanity is always in a state like that of your expedition when it doubled cape horn incompetent mutinous or sick unto death and what else can you expect in view of the conditions under which we all arrive on the planet the host now glanced uneasily at the professor of philosophy whose treatise on the world purpose was famous throughout three continents the professor was visibly arming himself for the fray. He had just filled his claret glass with port. Remember, said the host, that we must join the ladies in twenty minutes at the utmost. I'm not going to argue, replied the philosopher, after a resolute sip at his port. I'm going to tell you a story. Tell it in the drawing-room, said the son of the house, who had taken his pretty cousin down to dinner, and was a little exhilarated by that and by the excellence of his father's wine 
that is to say, and he spoke eagerly as if a bright idea had struck him, that is to say, of course, if it will bear telling in the presence of ladies. There was a roar of laughter, and the son of the house blushed to the roots of his hair. I am inclined to think, said the professor, that my story, so far from being unsuitable for the ladies, will be intelligible to no one else. We'll join the ladies at once, said the host, and hear the professor's story. The pessimist, who was fond of talking, now broke in. That, he said, is most attractive, but not quite fair to me. I should like to finish what I have begun, and I doubt if my views will be quite in place in the drawing-room. Besides, the professor must finish his port. I was only going to say, he went on, that the having to put up with all that comes in human shape is a very serious affair. It seems to me that we all arrive in the world like dumped goods. Nobody has ordered us, and nobody wants us. Our parents wanted us, did you say? Well, I suppose our parents wanted children. But it doesn't follow that they wanted you or me. Somebody else might have filled the book as well or better. Our birth is a matter of absolute chance. For example, my father has often told me how he met my mother. There was a picnic on a Swiss lake. My father's watch was slow, and when he arrived at the quay, the boat that carried his party was out of sight. It so happened that there was another party, people my father didn't know, going to another island. And seeing him disconsolate on the quay, they took pity on him and made him go with them. It was in that boat that he first met my mother. The moral is obvious. If my father's watch had kept better time, I should never have been in existence. A jolly good thing, too, whispered the son of the house. Neither would my six brothers nor any of our descendants to the nth generation. Well, that's how the whole planet gets itself manned. That's how the crew is chosen. And that's why the expedition gets into trouble on rounding Cape Horn. It's a capital introduction to my story, said the professor, in whom, after his second claret glass of port, the world purpose had assumed a new intensity. I wish the ladies could have heard it. I venture to think, said our host, that the ladies will understand the story all the better for not having heard the introduction. You see, I am assuming that the story is a good one, which is as much as to say that no introduction is needed. Thank you, said the professor. I say, broke in the son of the house, I say, professor, it's a pity you didn't take that question up in the world purpose. That's an awfully good point of the pessimists, and a jolly difficult one to answer, too. I should like to see you tackle it. Why, I once heard the pater here say to the mater, We'll go upstairs, said our host. About ten years ago, the professor began, I was traveling one night in a third-class carriage to a town on the northeast coast. My two companions in the compartment were evidently mother and daughter. The mother had a singularly beautiful and intelligent face, and the daughter, who was about twelve years old, resembled her. They were dressed in good taste, without rings or finery, and, so far as I am able to judge such things, without expense. Prior to the departure of the train from the London terminus, I had noticed the two walking up and down the platform and looking into the carriages, apparently endeavoring to find a compartment to themselves. They didn't succeed, and finally entered the compartment where I was. Whether I ought to have been flattered by this or the reverse, I knew not. I could see they wanted to be alone, and I felt a brief impulse to leave them to themselves and go elsewhere. It would have been a chivalrous act, but whether from indolence or curiosity or some other feeling, I let the impulse die and remained where I was. The girl began immediately to arrange cushions for her mother in the corner of the carriage, and from the solicitude she showed, I gathered that the mother, though to all appearance in health, was either ill or convalescent. By the time I had come to this conclusion, the train was already in motion, or I verily believe I should have obeyed my first impulse and left the carriage. I am glad, however, that I did not. When all had been arranged, I noticed that the two had settled themselves in the attitude of lovers, their hands clasped, the girls resting her head on her mother's shoulder and gazing into her face from time to time with a look of infinite tenderness. 
It was some relief to me to observe that, lover-like, they seemed indifferent to my presence. I was reading a book, though I confess that my eyes and mind would constantly wander to the other side of the carriage. I am not a sentimental person, and scenes of sentiment are particularly objectionable to my temper of mind. But for once in my life I was overawed by the consciousness that I was in the presence of deep and genuine emotion. Finally I gave up the effort to read. A strange mental atmosphere seemed to surround me. I fell into a reverie, and I remember waking suddenly from a kind of dream or incoherent meditation on the pathos and tragedy of human life. I looked at my companions, and I saw that both were weeping. The girl was in the same position as before. The mother had turned her face away, and was looking out into the blackness of the night. Tear after tear rolled down her cheek. They must have become conscious that I was observing them, though God knows I had little will to do so. I took up my book and pretended to read, and I knew that an effort was being made, that tears were being checked, that some climbing sorrow was being held down. Presently the lady said, speaking in a steady voice, "'Do you know the name of the station we have just passed?' I told her the name of the station, asked if I should raise the window, spoke to the girl, offered an illustrated paper, and so on, through the usual preliminaries of a traveller's talk. The answers I received were such as one expects from people of charming manners, but nothing followed for a time, and I again took up my book. The book I was reading, or pretending to read, was a volume of the Ingersoll Lectures, bearing on the back the title, Human Immortality. Once or twice I noticed the eyes of the woman resting on this, and I was greatly surprised when, in one of the pauses when I laid down the book, she said, "'Would you mind my asking you a question?' "'Certainly not.' "'Do you believe in the immortality of the soul?' As a teacher of philosophy, I am accustomed to leading questions at all sorts of inopportune moments, but never in my life was I so completely taken aback. However, I collected my thoughts as best I could, and though the subject is one on which I never like to speak without prolonged preparation, I briefly told her my opinions on that great problem, as you may find them expressed in my published works. Possibly I spoke with some fervor, the more likely, because I spoke without preparation. She listened with great attention, and as for the young girl, her face was lit up with a look of intelligent eagerness, which, had I seen it for one moment in my own classroom, would have rewarded me for the labor of a long course of lectures. I had still much to say when the train drew up at the platform of St. Bede's. "'I'm sorry not to hear more,' said the lady, "'but this is our destination.' "'And there is Dad!' cried the girl. A man in working clothes stood at the carriage door. "'Good-bye,' said the woman, warmly shaking me by the hand. "'You've been most kind to me.' "'Good-bye,' said the daughter. "'You're a dear old dear.' And with that she threw her arms around my neck and kissed me fervently three or four times. I was greatly surprised, but not altogether displeased. They were evidently a most affectionate family. As the train moved off, the three stood arm in arm before the carriage door. "'Got two sweethearts tonight, sir,' said the man. And without jealousy, said I, I congratulate you on each of them. I hope you'll forgive my daughter, he said. She's an impulsive little baggage. She may repeat the offense the next time we meet, I replied, and we all laughed. It was a joyful ending to what had been, in some respects, a painful experience. I don't see the point of your story, Professor, and I am at a loss to imagine what it has to do with my introduction. This from the pessimist. The story has only begun, said the professor, who was sipping his tea. Those kisses at the end were jolly hard lines on a man who dislikes sentiment, said the son of the house. I didn't find them so, answered the professor, but remember, they were only the kisses of a child. The best sort, growled the pessimist. True, said our hostess, the judgments of children are the judgments of God, but let the professor go on. It was seven or eight months later, the professor resumed, 
when on opening the times one morning my attention was caught by an item of news relating to the town at which my two companions had alighted from the train the news itself was of no importance but the name of the town printed at the head of the paragraph strangely arrested me and served to recall with singular vividness the incident of my former journey i found myself repeating in order and minute detail everything that had happened in the carriage some of the particulars of which i had forgotten till that moment the end of it was that i became possessed with a strong desire to visit st bede's though i had no connections whatever with the place and had never stayed there in my life i knew of course that it was an interesting old town with a famous cathedral and i remember persuading myself at the time and indeed telling my wife that i had to visit that cathedral without further delay as the day wore on the impulse grew stronger and eventually overpowered me i travelled down to st bede's that night and put up at one of the principal hotels the next morning was spent in the usual manner of sightseers in an ancient town reserving the cathedral for the afternoon i visited the old wall and the dismantled quays and wandered among the narrow streets reading history as my habit is from the monuments with which the place abounded about noon i found my way to the spacious marketplace and began inspecting the beautiful front of the old town hall i suddenly became aware of a man on the opposite pavement who was watching me with some interest what drew my attention to him was a large mass of white roses which he was carrying in a basket for as you know i have been for many years an enthusiastic rose grower and there is nothing which attracts the mind so rapidly as any circumstance connected with one's hobby the man was dressed in good clothes and it was this that prevented me at first from recognizing him as the person who had met my two companions at the station seven months before seeing that i observed him he crossed the street you remembered me he said well i have been looking for you all over the town had i known your name i should have asked at the hotels but how did you know i had arrived i asked my wife told me you were here she must have seen me then i said yes she saw you she saw you arrive last night at the station and she saw you later standing under an electric lamp in front of the cathedral this struck me as odd for i had purposely waited until near midnight before going to the cathedral that i might see the exterior in the light of the moon and i had been confident that not a soul was about how is she i asked for i remembered my previous impression that she was an invalid oh much better he answered in fact quite restored it's a great comfort it was very kind of her to send you to look for me i said perhaps i shall have the pleasure of seeing her later on in the day or your daughter as well you remember i congratulated you on your two sweethearts yes he answered and you were not far wrong in that but wouldn't you like to take a turn round the old town first it's a wonderful place and full of interest and i know it through and through i was greatly puzzled by his manner his speech and address were certainly remarkable for a working man and i confess that for a moment the thought crossed my mind that he was some sort of impostor and that i should be well advised to have nothing to do with him i suppose it was his basket of roses that reassured me well i said i've seen a good deal today but i've no objection to seeing it all again i'll put myself in your hands splendid he cried it's an ideal day and i'm hungering for sunlight and beauty and thirsting for the peace of ancient memories and it will please my wife to know that i've taken you around what do you say to going up the river first there's a glorious reach beyond the bridge and the sun's in the right position to give you the best view of the cathedral nothing would please me better said i and we set off at once toward the river on passing a certain building he bade me carefully examine the roof the form of which was remarkable while i was engaged in so doing unconscious for a moment of his presence i suddenly seemed to hear him groan behind me and turning round i saw that he was holding tight to the iron railings on the other side of the footwalk and swaying his body backward and forward as though he were in pain 
"'Are you ill?' I asked, in some alarm. "'Not at all. This is just my way of resting when I'm tired. Come along.' "'That's a splendid lot of roses in your basket,' I said, as we took our places in the boat, he sculling and I steering. "'Frau Karl Drutschke, unless I'm much mistaken.' "'Yes, I grew them on my allotment. I'm taking them home to my wife.' For some time we talked roses. He had a theory of pruning which differed from mine, and led to a good deal of argument. Finally he dropped his skulls, and, taking a piece of paper from his pocket, drew on it the diagram of a rose-bush, pruned according to his method. We had forgotten the cathedral. I took his drawing and began to criticize. "'Oh,' he said, "'let's drop it. We're missing one of the noblest sights in England. Look at that!' And he pointed to the heights. As we dropped down the river half an hour later, my companion, who had been silent for some time, again broke out on the subject of roses. "'Rose growing is a thing that takes time and patience and thought,' he said. "'More perhaps than it's worth. If it were not for my wife, I should give it up. She's desperately fond of roses.' "'That's the best of reasons for not giving it up,' I answered. "'I happen to be a great admirer of your wife.' "'That's another link between us,' said he. "'She's the best wife man ever had. "'She's worthy of all the admiration you can give her.' "'She's worthy of all the roses you can grow for her,' I said. "'By God, she is!' he answered with an emphasis that startled me. "'We grew confidential, and a story followed. "'He told me that he was the illegitimate son of a baronet, "'that his father had made him an allowance to study art in London, "'that he had married his model in opposition to the wishes of his father, "'that the baronet had thereupon thrown him over for good and all,' that he had failed to make a living by his original art, that he had gotten an engagement with a great furnishing house as a skilled painter, that he was earning four pounds a week in doing artistic work in rich men's houses and elsewhere, that he was now engaged in restoring some fifteenth-century frescoes in a parish church. His wife earned money too, though he did not tell me how, and his daughter was being trained as a singer. We're all more or less in art, he said, and we are a very happy family. By this time we were back at the landing place, and as the man stepped ashore he said, It's about time I took these roses to my wife. We'll just walk along to where I live, and I'll show you the rest of the sights afterwards. I'll take you to the cathedral when the afternoon service is over. As we walked through the streets, the man kept up an incessant stream of talk, pointing to this and that, and discoursing with great eagerness on the history and antiquities of the town. It struck me as strange that he never waited for an answer, but passed from one thing to another without pause. Presently we stopped in front of a small house, one of a row of villas. "'This is where I live,' he said, and stopped on the doorstep. "'Good!' I cried. "'Now you will take me in and reintroduce me to your charming wife.' "'I'm sorry,' he answered, "'but the thing's quite impossible.' I was so startled by this unexpected answer that, without thinking, I blurted out the question, "'Why?' "'Because,' he said, "'she's in her coffin. "'She died at four o'clock this morning.' At the words, he sank down on his doorstep, put the basket of roses on his knees, and bowed himself over them in a passion of tears. The door opened, and the young girl, who had been with me in the train, ran down the steps. Sitting down beside her father, she put her arms round his neck and said, "'Daddy, Daddy, don't cry!' The professor ceased, and there was a long pause. "'Did you discover,' said the pessimist at length, "'why the two were weeping in the train?' "'No need to ask that,' said our hostess. "'The woman had received sentence of death.' "'Did you ever follow it up?' said the historian. "'What, for example, became of the young girl?' "'She was married to my eldest son last month,' said the professor. "'I knew the pessimist's introduction would not be needed,' said our host. "'Nevertheless, it was the introduction that reminded me of the story,' said the professor. "'And now,' he continued, "'can anyone here explain to me 
the strange conduct of the man with the white roses, for I confess that I can find no place for it in any system of psychology known to me. At this question, the son of the house, who, for some reason, had become the gravest member of the party, looked up, and seemed about to speak. But as he raised his eyes, they met the bright glance of his pretty cousin, on whose cheek there was a tear. And when the son of the house saw that, the impulse to speech died within him. No one else ventured an explanation, but my impression was that there were two persons in the room to whom the strange conduct of the man with the white roses presented no enigma. End of White Roses by L. P. Jacks <laughs>